The U.S. government is back and open for business after a three-day shutdown. Democrats and Republicans strike a deal, but who are the real winners and losers? Ahmed Nan Nawaz, today's newsmaker, is the divided U.S. Congress. Hundreds of thousands of U.S. federal employees have gone back to work after a compromise in Congress. Both Republicans and Democrats are claiming victory, although neither really can be completely satisfied. The status of the Dreamers is still unresolved. They're the undocumented migrants who entered the United States as children. Opinion polls show most Americans blame the GOP for the shutdown, but the whole episode has reignited a debate about the effectiveness of Congress. Is it still able to carry out its duties, or is the system broken? Here's Randolph Nogle. Thank you for calling the White House. Unfortunately, we cannot answer your call today because congressional Democrats are holding government funding, including funding for our troops and other national security priorities, hostage to an unrelated immigration debate. Due to this obstruction, the government is shut down. It was a short battle that's now come to an end. But who really won? We're back in business. We had a weekend of pain, and we're back open for business. On Friday at midnight, the U.S. government shut down. It's laid on the table. Less than 72 hours later, Republicans and Democrats agreed on a temporary spending bill to keep the government going. But it's the fourth such measure since October, and it may be a sign that the war is far from over. In a few hours, the government will reopen. We have a lot to do. The issue of the Dreamers demands resolution. A budget must be written. Health care has to be addressed. The Trump shutdown will soon end, but the work must go on, and it will. The gridlock was largely due to a disagreement over the status of undocumented migrants who came to the U.S. as minors. Most Democrats supported Senate party leader Chuck Schumer for not budging on the issue. But now some of the party's left flank accuse him of being weak-willed for eventually relenting without much to show for it. Mr. Bozeman. The Republicans insisted they wouldn't negotiate with a gun to their head. The question now is can Congress come together on an issue that has been continually deferred? No dreamer! No peace! No dreamer! No peace! No dreamer! No peace! You know, it's disappointing knowing that certain Democrats voted with a continued resolution that will not carry a Clean Dream Act. Um, that is honestly something that it's, this isn't, like I said, this isn't an immigration issue anymore. It's a humanitarian issue. It's just another form of, another form of betrayal. I've lived my life, uh, you know, my entire life in this country. I pledge allegiance to its flag. Um, and so for them to say that they're not willing to protect us, um, it's a betrayal. The so-called dreamers have lived in limbo since the DREAM Act was first introduced more than 15 years ago. It would give them a path to citizenship as opposed to being deported to countries they've never known. While the proverbial can has once again been kicked down the road for these young undocumented migrants, the shutdown did force a debate on the issue. It would be my intention to proceed to legislation that would address DACA, border security, and related issues. The man who co-sponsored the first DREAM Act bill, Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, urged DREAMers to remain patient. For the first time in five years, we will have a debate on the floor of the Senate on the DREAM Act and immigration. To all the dreamers who are watching today, don't give up. I know that you, your lives are hanging in the balance on what we do here on Capitol Hill and with the White House. What the president did clearly worked. While the White House is claiming victory, the short-lived shutdown will soon be forgotten. But with another budget deadline just weeks away, the Democrats will have to push hard to protect 700,000 people facing possible deportation. If they fail, they may find their position weakened against an administration many see as being more intent on building walls than mending fences. Randolph Nogle, The Newsmakers. And joining me now from Miami, Florida is John Cardillo. John is the host of the US talk show Off the Cuff. In Singapore, we have Steve Okin, who served in the U.S. administration of former Democratic President Bill Clinton. He's now the CEO of the consultancy firm APAC Advisors. And completing our panel, Richard Johnson, 
He's a lecturer in US politics and international relations at the University of Lancaster in the United Kingdom. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. John, I have to start with you because you're a supporter of President Trump. This does not reflect well on the leader of the United States nor his Republican Party, considering the Republicans control both the House of Representatives and the Senate. That's ridiculous. No, no, no. We have a, a clitora here in the United States which requires 60 votes. It was the Democrats who wanted to shut the government down in favor of illegal aliens. They lost. They ultimately caved on every point. And we've seen the polling gap close. Democrats were polling 18 points above Republicans going into our November midterm elections this year, 2018. President Trump's tax reform bill closed that gap to four points. Now we're seeing an exodus from the Democratic Party by Democratic voters who are now registering as independents or non-party affiliated because the Democrats caved on everything. This reflects very well on the Republicans. We stood our ground. We got what we wanted. We did not put illegal aliens above American citizens and our military, despite the way the media spins this. On behalf of the Democrats and the liberals, this was a massive win for Republicans, a massive win for President Trump. The Democrats are the minority party here. They, they came to understand that, and they got nothing. Very big win for us on the right. You know, Republican supporters would agree with you, of course, uh, John, but Steve, that's not what the opinion polls say. At the moment, people seem to be blaming the Republicans for the shutdown. Well, I mean, I think if you, if I Googled before I came on congressional dysfunction, and the first book that came up was written in 1999. So what we have today is nothing new. It's just a lot worse than it's been. I actually think if you go back to 1999, you would say Congress operated well compared to what operated today. What happened over the past you know, few days was basically a stalemate. Nothing was solved other than children getting, getting health care provided for them for the, their insurance covered for the next six years. We're going to go through this again in three weeks. So it, it, no one won, no one lost uh, other than the American public. We all lost. But this battle is going to come up again. Um, the American public, uh, by a large majority, are in favor of doing something to help those children who came to the United States, who are called dreamers, who came to the United States as children, undocumented, with their parents. And so hopefully we will get a solution to that you know, before uh, they get deported uh, come March. OK, we will definitely come on to the dreamers in a moment, and we'll come on to illegal aliens, as you call them, John. But first of all, as Steve has alluded there, Richard Johnson, that there's a problem in the American system. Is it completely dysfunctional now? This is not the first time there's been a shutdown of the U.S. government, although, of course, it is unprecedented with the Republicans controlling both the House and the Senate. But moving away from that and looking at the system as a whole, what's your assessment? Well, the American system has tremendous number of veto players, which means that there are lots of sort of blocking steps along the way that you have to get over in order to get legislation passed. It's an extremely anti-majoritarian system. And what's happened in recent years in the United States is that the American political parties have become much more ideologically cohesive, which wasn't the way that they used to be. American political parties now resemble in many ways the kind of political parties which, say, uh, you know, I'm familiar with in Western Europe. These are parties that have clear agendas, clear ideologies. But that doesn't map very well onto the American political institutions, which require, for example, in the Senate, the filibuster requires effectively a supermajority to pass major pieces of legislation. And what the Democrats have been doing in the last few weeks is adopting the same tactics which the Republicans adopted when President Obama was president, which is basically to, to try and gain as many concessions as possible from their political opponents, not through deal making, but through uh, crisis and uh, working on the cliff edge. I think at the end of the day, this is ultimately going to be quite damaging for the American system going forward. That it, uh, I can't see a way out of this. I see that America is going more and more into a spiral of legislating through crisis, which isn't good for the health of the country or the political system. Very interesting. Uh, John, I tell you what, before we come to the nitty gritty of where we go from here, I just want to get your reaction to the international analysis of this shutdown, OK? Because I do believe that optics are important. You know, when it comes down to the basic citizen around the world, they look at the top couple of lines of a story. They may not necessarily look at the, look at the detail. So indulge me for a moment. In El Universal, which is Mexico's largest paper, direct quote, no president until now has suffered a shutdown when their party controls both houses of Congress. Trump is the first. In the Financial Times, one of the world's great papers, 
Mr. Trump vowed he would be a deal maker. That was his main selling point. In addition to being unable to uphold a deal with Democrats, Mr. Trump disagrees with crucial White House officials. The president's own people are in a state of rolling confusion about what he wants. And just finally, in Le Figaro, the French paper, if the shutdown is suspended today, which now we know it is, the Democrats will have showed that Republicans who control both chambers of Congress are not capable of doing the first task of a government, to vote to fund the essential functions of the state. That's how much of the world is seeing what happened with the shutdown. Well, let me, a lot, lot to cover here. Let me first say, this is the first time on the show I've actually agreed with my colleagues. The two gentlemen on the panel with me are not wrong. Look, our Congress is dysfunctional. I think we disagree on how detrimental it is to the United States and, and whether or not the Dems will win here. But let's go, let's run down those three publications. Mexico should stick to Mexico and worry about their own horrible, terrible country that the drug cartels run. There are bodies hanging in the streets, U.S. tourists being murdered in resort towns with cartel violence, Mexico can't find an honest police officer with a magnifying glass. The place is a cesspool. Yeah, but that's of, got of nothing to do with the narco shutdown. That's got nothing second. to they're, do with the shutdown. Ramp it. It, has every, it has everything to do with it because the shutdown took a hard line on immigration from Mexico. So that's all Mexico is upset about. We don't want their illegality in our nation. Look, President Trump has an America first agenda. The Financial Times and Le Figaro, both left-wing publications, and quite frankly, who cares what the world thinks? President Trump ran on America first. And at the end of the day, the UN still comes to us with their handout begging. NATO still needs the United States to remain strong, and the rest of the world needs us to buy their goods. So they can criticize us all they want. But at the end of the day, they need America. They beg us for money. They beg us for military help. And that's not going to change. So quite frankly, we had too many presidents who worried about the opinions of the world while the world turned a blind eye. The world turned a blind eye after 9-11. The world turned a blind eye when America needed help. We're always there with our checkbook. We're always there with our military. Americans shed blood to free billions around the world from oppression when other countries sat idly by. We now have a president that puts America first. So quite frankly, I and many others on the right, many Americans, couldn't care less with global liberals and globalists think. OK, well, we'll see what Americans think in November, Steve. Of course, midterm elections, every single seat in the House of Representatives, 33 seats in the Senate are going to be up for grabs. Do you think this is going to make a difference, or come November, will people have forgotten about the shutdown? I, I think what people are going to look at is what is President Trump's approval rating, um, and that is going to sway a lot of those down-ballot races. Right now, his approval rating is the lowest that there has ever been uh, since Gallup has been doing this polling post-World War II. No president has been below 40 percent. The lowest it's been before is 49 percent, um, and he's at 39 percent. And if his approval rating stays low, despite the fact that the economy is doing relatively well on, on a lot of measures, like, like the stock market, and despite the fact the tax reform went through. Um, he's the, the Republicans are, are in serious trouble. And, and the shutdown um, and the abil inability to work across the aisle and address issues that a majority of the Americans want, and again, I'll come back to the Dreamers, the majority of the Americans want the Dreamers to stay in the United States. Um, they may want border security. They may want um, more action against certain undocumented workers, but they don't want that against the Dreamers. And if, if, the, if Trump's approval stays below 40, then the Republicans are likely going to lose the House, and the Senate's going to come down to a few seats. It's going to be who do the Republicans nominate in states like Arizona and Nevada as to whether the Senate will flip as well. And I will just say, I was in the, the Clinton administration when, when the House went from Democratic to Republican in, in 94 to 96. And when you have a party against you in the Congress, your life in the executive branch becomes a lot more difficult. And that's what's going to happen uh, to this administration unless something changes fast. OK, gentlemen, you're forcing me to move on to the Dreamers. You are always, you keep mentioning the Dreamers. OK, so Richard Johnson, being uh, non-politically affiliated compared to uh, our two American guests, what has Donald Trump and what has the Republican Party got against immigrants? Well, look, I think that this is part of... We heard it earlier from our re Republican guests that this is... The president has this America first um, message that he's speaking to a proportion of the American population that is uh, broadly, uh, you know, in favor of uh, limiting immigration into the country. And so this 
fight over the, the shutdown in some ways speaks very well to that, to that base, that the president can say that the, that the Democrats held the country hostage over illegal, uh, illegal immigrants. And so I think the Democrats have to be very careful here. Um, you know, on one hand, the Democrats clearly uh, ideologically are very committed to trying to find some uh, solution for uh, those who are uh, un undocumented in the United States. But they also have uh, a large number of their senators who are up for election in November in states which have very low Hispanic populations, states which are less than 5% Hispanic, you know, Montana, North Dakota, uh, you know, Wisconsin, uh, Indiana. You know, these, are not, uh, these are not states where the, the darker issue plays very well. And, and their senators could really be at risk of losing their seats. And so I, I understand that the Republicans have a couple of senators who are vulnerable in states like Arizona and Nevada, but the electoral map looks a lot, in the Senate at least, looks a lot worse for the Democrats. 26 out of 33 Senate seats that are up this time are Democratic-held seats. They have a lot of defenses. And I think that this issue may not play very well in many of those states. And so I think it's, it's a real challenge for them. John, do you see the point of view of people who believe that Donald Trump's immigration policies are based on racism? There was that infamous phrase that he used about people coming from a certain type of country, the profanity that he used about people coming from those countries to come and live in the United States. Uh, the things that he said in the campaign about Mexicans coming to the United States, the fact that just recently his government has taken away the protected status of El Salvadorans who live in the United States. There are only 200,000 El Salvadorans there, and independent figures say almost 90% of them are in the workforce. What's he got against those people? They're contributing to America. American society. There are people who believe that all of his immigration policies are based on pure racism, not security. And th those people are morons. This has nothing to do with race. This has to do with, with American sovereignty. Illegal means illegal. Look, my, my colleague from Lancaster is right. There are, are, are more Democrats vulnerable this time around than Republicans. And I'm glad he brought up Arizona. Let's look at Arizona. New study came out from the Crime Prevention Research Center here in the U.S. that illegal aliens in Arizona are 142 percent more likely to be arrested for violent crimes than both legal immigrants, people that went through the process properly, that every American, left, right, and center, embraces and wants here. Legal immigrants go through the process properly, no matter what country they're from. They contribute to our nation. They make America greater. They want to make America great again. That also, that also means legal immigrants. But illegal aliens, 142% more likely to be arrested uh, on a violent crime in Arizona. Illegal aliens from El Salvador, com uh, El Salvador comprise the very violent drug enforcement, child sex trafficking gang, MS-13, a murderous gang that rapes and murders teenagers. We are talking about those who are here illegally. Now, let's talk about the Dreamers really quickly. The, this misnomer that Steve and other Democrats like to put out there, that their children is ridiculous. U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service data from September 2017 tells us that the average age of a Dreamer is 24 years old. In fact, only 0.3% of the alleged 800,000, I think it's more than 800,000, 0.3% around 2,000 are under age 16. So this narrative that these are little toddlers is simply ridiculous and just another lie perpetrated on Americans by Democrats and progressives. John, pick up on that. Uh, sorry, thank you, John. Steve, pick up on that point, please, because my understanding of the situation was that they were called dreamers because they were minors when they came to the states and they're not minors anymore. And therefore, the outside world, and I'm sure a lot of Democrats as well, People think, hold on, surely it's the humane thing to do not to break up a family. If a child was brought into the States illegally, it's not that child's fault, that child now being an adult, as John says. They're now above age of being classified as children. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the dreamers are the age of, of when they came and when, when, yes, no, that's right. And when Congress refused to, to work with President Obama, which was Congress's right, it was a Republican Congress, they refused to work with President Obama. So President Obama took executive action to grant, uh, you could call it amnesty, you could call it uh, temporary protection um, to those who came to the, to the country with their parents. Now, what's happened is that President Trump took that away, threw it back to the Congress and said, you basically have six months to fix it. And that deadline is coming up in March. And what 
will be interesting to see is will the Republicans work with the Democrats, be willing to have some Republicans left behind and vote against a bill, um, voting for a bill both in the House and the Senate that will grant the Dreamers the protections that Congress should have granted them that, that didn't require President Obama's action. And, and so it is very compassionate. It's very understanding. They are all hardworking. If, if, you, if you've committed a crime as a Dreamer, you're not staying in the United States. And so this isn't about illegal and undocumented immigrants because they're now under a protected status. It's what's the right thing to do. And because the Democrats have basically no power in the, in the House, um, and they have very limited power in the Senate, all they can do is use that, that filibuster. When something has to pass, they can block it if they can withhold 10 Democrats from voting for something. And five of those red state Democrats did vote initially um, with the Republicans to keep the, the budget uh, going and, and keep the, the executive branch funded. And it is a, it's very difficult. And the Democrats are walking a tightrope because you don't want the military furloughed. I was furloughed when I worked in the government, and I didn't get paid when I was out. Others didn't get paid when they were out. And that's not fair. I'm not worried so much about myself. It's, it's the single mom and the single dads who, who rely and are living paycheck to paycheck who, who work for our government. You don't want to hold them hostage. But that's the, the tightrope the Democrats have to, have to walk, and they're going to have to walk it again in three weeks. OK, you know what? I'm going to have ask, to give can I, can oh, I yeah, ask, Go on, John. Go on. Can I ask? I just want a quick question for Steve. If, if the DACA issue is not just a ploy by Democrats to be obstructionist, why, when Barack Obama had the executive in both houses, he had the House and the Senate, and he rammed Obamacare through, why didn't he pass protections for DACA then? He controlled all three branches of government. He even had the Supreme Court leaning his way. Why didn't they push it through then if it's not just an obstructionist ploy and an effort to gain more votes for Democrats through amnesty and eventual citizenship for illegals? I'd, I'd like to hear from Steve, okay. who actually worked in the Clinton sure. administration. No problem. A brief answer, if you can, please, Steve. Sure, sure. Well, one point I will make, we, we, the Democrats, I wasn't there then, I was not in that administration, did not ram Obamacare through. Obamacare had hearing after hearing in the House, in the Senate. The Democrats tried to work with the Republicans. They couldn't get a single Republican vote. It ended why up didn't they pass being voted on in party why lines. They, it was different they, back then. They, they did try and reach out. Why? why? And it, it, it wasn't the issue eight years ago, nine years ago, that it became. I mean, that's, you know, things change. Circumstances change. It became much more of a, uh, of a known issue. It became much more important to the Democratic Party over time. And so that's, that's why it changed over time. Things change with the Republican Party over time. Okay. They were little children. That's I'll tell you when what, the narrative was true. They were children. John, we will give you Steve's phone number, okay, and you can continue this conversation <laughs> off air. Thank we you. really appreciate it. John Cardillo, Steve Oaken, and Richard Johnson, thank you for your time. <laughs> After the break, Donald Trump has been given a clean bill of health. But is he mentally fit for office? We'll ask the psychiatrist who warned Congress that Trump's mental state is unraveling. And the former football star George Weir faces his greatest test as he assumes the presidency in Liberia. If he had uh, some type of mental a cognitive issue that this test is sensitive enough, it would pick up on it. He would not have got 30 out of 30 on the test. So I'm very confident at this particular stage that he has nothing like that going on. That's the White House physician, Dr. Ronnie Jackson, giving Donald Trump a clean bill of health. But not everyone agrees with the Rear Admiral's assessment, especially when it comes to the president's mental well-being. Trump's behavior has ranged from late-night Twitter rants boasting about the size of his nuclear button to incoherent speeches. Some psychiatrists say he could have anything from Alzheimer's to narcissistic personality disorder. But is Trump's mental health fragile enough to cost him the White House? Or are the accusations against the president orchestrated by his political enemies? The 25th Amendment of the US Constitution allows for the commander in chief to be suspended if he's unable to discharge the powers or duties of the office. Some lawmakers are so concerned they've summoned Yale University's Dr. Bandy Lee to give them a briefing on Donald Trump. Well, let's speak to the doctor herself. Psychiatrist Bandy Lee joins us now from New York. Uh, Dr. Lee, do you agree with the assessment made by the White House physician? Hello. First, thanks for having me. Uh, let me make clear I'm speak speaking for myself and not my university. 
with regard to uh, Dr. Jackson's assessment, uh, he did a cognitive screen, which showed a perfect score. But unfortunately, what we were recommending at this time was not a screen, but a full examination. A screen merely picks up signs that warrant additional testing. And we already have seen a number of signs that warrant testing without this screen. Uh, I think the perfect score, rather, outlines the, uh, the limitations of the screen itself, that it was just a screen and not a full exam. OK, I tell you what, we'll come on to that cognitive assessment, which was one part of that medical exam that the president went through. But before we get into any more details, Dr. Lee, how do you feel about making an assessment regarding a person that you've never met before? Because some people would say that that's unethical. Well, I think this is exactly where uh, mental health professionals do need to weigh in, because we can distinguish signs that are concerning and require further evaluation versus uh, what are simply variations of the normal. And armchair psychiatry or psychiatry from a distance is exactly what we are trying to avoid by calling for a full evaluation, for thorough, full, in-person evaluation. But you have, have you not made a psychiatric evaluation of Donald Trump and spoken to other media outlets by speaking to us here on the Newsmakers? And look, we very much appreciate your contribution because it's something that many, many people are talking about. But just by, by talking to us, you're breaking the rules of the American Psychiatric Association. You know full well the Goldwater Rule, which says that you shouldn't be making these kind of assessments public if you haven't spoken to the person who you're publicly assessing, and that they should have given you permission first. Why is it so important for you to make these evaluations in a public forum? Um... It's just, it's not just myself. It is, uh, there are thousands of us. There are 27 mental health experts who contributed to a book that I edited on this topic. But now there are thousands of us who have formed a national coalition about our concerns. Now, with re respect to the Goldwater Rule, which prohibits psychiatrists from diagnosing from afar, I'm a very strong proponent of it. And it is exactly because I am a strong proponent of the Goldwater Rule that we are calling for an evaluation. And assessing dangerousness is not about diagnosing someone from afar. It is about assessing the situation. And this is an individual who has already shown signs of dangerousness. Now, some of the dangers are out there there in hard data in terms of unprecedented spikes in hate crimes that have not abated, uh, escalation of gun violence and gun deaths that are unprecedented, and also uh, widespread schoolyard bullying that attribute their actions especially, um, specifically to Mr. Trump. And so we have a wide range of data now to show that, uh, that he does pose a danger by his occupying the office of the presidency. Are you saying that when President Donald Trump makes statements, it creates a dangerous situation for citizens of the United States who are living mm -hmm. in the U.S.? Yes, it, it creates dangers for the nation and the world. Uh, these are public health threats that he poses, not an issue, uh, not a personal issue about his personal mental health. And that is one of the reasons why we not only call for a full neuropsychiatric evaluation, which would be able to tell uh, what is going on with him, but, but that actually, the results of that would be his personal affair. What is uh, the affair of the public is um, whether or not he has the capacity to fulfill his role in his office. That is a capacity evaluation that we have been requesting, and, uh, and that only deals with function, not a diagnosis or his personal mental health. Don't you think there might be a distinction between mental capacity, mental health, and actually intellectual ability? Could it not just be that he's not necessarily the smartest president the United States has had, and that therefore he might have a problem grasping certain issues which are important to do his job, that it may have nothing to do with his mental state. It could just be that other thing, understanding and a lack of it. Exactly. A capacity evaluation, among other things, would, would be able to evaluate whether he's 
whether or not he's able to take in needed information and advice, whether he's able to process that information, and whether he's able to weigh uh, different consequences before he makes um, sound, logical, reality-based uh, decisions. And these are the kinds of things that uh, capacity evaluation would test. And it has nothing to do with mental illness or uh, diagnosis or even uh, specifically uh, cognitive or psychological or neurological uh, capabilities. It looks at the whole and simply assesses function. In fact, our, uh, our assessment of his risk for danger and his dangerousness that has manifested already, these have nothing to do with mental illness. Uh, mentally ill individuals are no more violent than, than the general population. Uh, they are more likely to be victims than perpetrators, uh, and th therefore most uh, dangerous individuals are not mentally ill. So we're not making a statement that he has a mental illness or that he has a certain diagnosis, but that he is a danger and needs to be evaluated. Okay, I'm glad you pointed that out. That, that's a very important distinction to make. Uh, we've just got a small example of the Montreal Cognitive Assessment that... Uh, Dr. Ronnie Jackson gave to the president, apparently on the president's insistence. What do you make of this particular Montreal assessment? Because when we in the office were looking at it, we were thinking actually it was fairly straightforward. There are three drawings of animals there, and you have to name which one is a lion, which one is another sort of animal. They're very obvious things. You have to copy the shape of a cube. You have to remember some words. It didn't look particularly challenging at all. Yes, as, as I said before, it's simply a screen. Uh, if there were reasons to believe that he needed a screen, um, uh, and often those who are over the age of 65, uh, screens are often routinely given, but, but as I've noted before, it's simply a screen that you normally give to individuals who have shown no other signs to indicate a full evaluation. So th this would indicate uh, signs, additional signs. It doesn't detect all the signs that are necessary for additional testing. Uh, and therefore, it is a very quick 10-minute uh, screen uh, that is comparable to what is called a mini mental state exam. It's a little more involved and a little more specific to uh, dementia, such as Alzheimer's dementia. But it's, it's nothing more than that. It's simply a screen. Dr. Bandy Lee, we appreciate you joining us on The Newsmakers. Thank you very much indeed. From footballing legend to Liberian president, George Weir has led an incredible life. Growing up in poverty, he beat the odds and became a global star. But now he faces what must surely be his greatest challenge. Liberia is still feeling the effects of two civil wars. More than 60% of the population lives below the poverty line. The economy is in dire straits. So will President Weir be the man to solve these problems? His critics say he's not ready to hold office. Weir brushes all of that off. He says he's striving for excellence. Shoaib Hassan reports. They called him King George on the football pitch. And Liberians hope former superstar George Weir can replicate that success as their new president. I'm here because of George Weir. I love him so much. He has known that he's one of the poor people. That is why I'm here. I'm here because of my country. He has known that he will do more for us. That is why I'm here. I'm so happy. I've been behind him since 2003. It's support like this that helped him defeat main rival and then vice president Joseph Bokai in a runoff election on December the 26th. Something where himself is quite aware of. I am for I believe that the overwhelming mandate that I, that I receive from the Liberian people is a mandate to end corruption in public service. I promise to deliver on this mandate. But that may not be an easy task in a country still coming to terms with its violent past. Ending corruption eluded its predecessor who had been inaugurated with similar hopes. Former President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 for her role in ending conflict in Liberia. 
the two civil wars were some of the most brutal on the African continent. Widespread rapes and massacres were carried out by drugged child soldiers between 1989 and 2003. When the war ended, Johnson Sirleaf beat George Weir in peaceful elections. But the optimism surrounding her appointment has long since faded. Accusations of nepotism and endemic corruption led to a sharp fall in her popularity. Her term was also marred with poor economic growth and rampant unemployment, currently standing at more than 60%. That has disillusioned ordinary Liberians, who have now invested their hope in where. He says his priority is to help the poor. But there is also unease about his statements supporting lesser taxes on big business, leading many to ask, can he drag the country out of its current economic crisis? Shoaib Hassan, the newsmakers. Joining me now from Liberia's capital, Monrovia, is Ibrahim al Bakri Ney. He's a researcher, policy analyst and columnist. In Birmingham, in the United Kingdom, is Amos Tway, the former deputy spokesman of Liberia's Unity Party, the one that lost the latest elections. And in London for us, Alex Vines, who heads the Africa program at Chatham House. Alex is also a former member of the UN panel of experts on Liberia. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Well, we have to start in Monrovia, Ibrahim, because you're on the scene. The inauguration is complete. How does the country feel right now as a former footballer becomes your country's new leader? Well, there's huge euphoria and it all appears as though George Weah's presidency is a national consensus. There were jubilations across various shades of the political divide. People from all over the country were celebrating and congratulat uh, congratulatory messages came from nearly all of the political parties. So it looks like a national consensus. Amos, do you agree with that? It's a national consensus. The turnout in the second round that Weir won, it was only just over 55%. And he is, after all, a man who has no political experience to speak of. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I do certainly agree partly that, uh, you know, the euphoria in Monovia suggests uh, that there is a consensus or there was a consensus and that uh, the excitement, uh, you know, is, is, but it's actually based on a couple of factors. Uh, from our perspective as, as the newest opposition, we feel that uh, the victory of George Weir is something that was were, that were generally aided by uh, the, uh, the 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 you know the machineries of uh, the executive mansion and in, in, in the past immediate government led by Mrs. Ellie Johnson Sleeve, uh, you will recall that uh, there has been consistent support uh, of 38 percent for George Weah presidency from 2005 2011 and up to the first round of the 2017 election. That particular 38 percent you know was consistent. So uh, for him to have you know increased that particular percentage point to 61. One, it took a number of different, you know, steps and, 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 and work behind the background. So generally, given what the analysis that we did, given all of the different fundings that we, 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 we have, the, the executive mansion led by Mrs. Ellie Johnson Sleeve generally aided the, 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 the victory of George Weir against the vice president, her vice president of the Republic of Liberia, Joseph Yomar I mean, on, on countless of occasions, uh, you were, there, were, there were local government officials who uh, were coerced, who were induced, who were mandated to run campaign for George Weir. Uh, if they didn't do so, they would have lost their job. So yes, of course, so generally there is an excitement, but we feel very seriously that uh, there was some level of, of, you know, high play of deception and hypocrisy on the part of the president of the, the past immediate president of the Republic of Liberia, who generally aided the support or the victory of George Mane Weir. Okay, Alex, what are the dangers of appointing George Weir as the president of his native Liberia? Well, I mean, look, a couple of points. The first is that George Weir, it's third time lucky. He tried twice and he didn't succeed. The third time he did, and that's partly because he got beyond that 38% that you've just heard about. Um, it's that he became cleverer, he learned from his mistakes, he networked, he came into an alliance 
with the uh, ex-wife of the former lawyer, Charles Taylor, Jewel Taylor. Uh, she provided a regional, uh, uh, regional block of votes for him, which is why he won clearly in the second round uh, of the elections with some 61%. So the, the lesson number one is that George Ware can learn, that he can improve, which is one of his points. He's a human being, but he learns from his mistakes. He moves forward. Uh, his biggest single challenge uh, to start with is the other buzzword that uh, uh, the colleagues in this interview have been uh, saying, which is the word euphoria. He's going to have to manage the expectations of Liberians pretty damn quickly because, as you've said, the economy is in a really poor state. Uh, and he, you know, he was a celebrity as a football player, but as a head of state, he is going to have to manage those expectations because he's not going to be able to score goals all the time. There are going to have to be trade-offs. There are going to be setbacks. It's a very, very difficult task. But at least he's got the goodwill of the Liberian people right at this moment. Sure, the economy is one thing. He inherits high levels of unemployment, domestic debt, a depreciated currency, growth projections of only 4%. Before the Ebola outbreak, they were near to 8%. There's corruption with impunity. There's a lot of problems, declining human development indices, of which I'll give you a hard fact in a moment, but I don't want to bombard you with everything. All of you know the state of Liberia. Ibrahim, it's a question of who he surrounds himself with, because all great managers, all great corporate bosses, they believe the delegation is the key. Who do we know is advising George Weir? Who are the people that he has in his ear telling him this is the way to run Liberia and improve the country? Well, George Weir has four set of people around him. The first set is the group of young revolutionaries that organized the original Congress for Democratic Change, who are very, very much exuberant and zealous for a change. They want a new Liberia. That's one set of advisors. And there is the new alliances that he has built over the last two years. One is the alliance from the Charles Taylor's camp, which uh, Professor Alex Vine mentioned, his wife. And the second alliance is the alliance with the former speaker, who was ousted for corruption. Now the third alliance is the alliance with the camp of Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, or immediate kitchen cabinet, lastly aligned with uh, George Weir. We saw that she did not openly campaign for George Weir, but close allies of hers were, in, were at the forefront of George Weir's campaign. So we will encourage George Weir to work closely with the young revolutionaries that have fought for the CDC who brings to the who bring to the table new ideas, new innovation, new energy, and with the vigor to transform this society. We are we have to distance himself from people that are already tinted with records of corruption and people who have been tested, tried, and failed over the last 12 years. So he, he has appointed a finance minister who is very progressive, who has some thought about radical economic transformation. So we expect that this finance minister will help to generate meaningful reforms in the economy in the next one year or so. But again, the expectations have to be considerably managed. Yes, absolutely. So, Amos, this is the point, right? Everything that Weir says is based on hope. The key thing about hope is that it's a forward-thinking emotion. You can only think positively about, when you, about using the word hope. But hope is not enough. There's a lack of detail in all of his campaign. Is there more detail now that he's president? Has he, in the past few weeks, been putting some flesh on the bones of how he's going to change the country? Well, you, well, well the, 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 point, the point is that, uh, given what we are seeing just from last night, the, uh, the first set of appointment that uh, George opened we are May, from last night up to this morning, uh, there is a clear indication uh, that uh, we are actually agitated his way to the presidency with no detailed policy framework, no specific vision, uh, given the fact that, you know, there was some level of discontent uh, amongst the citizens. So we uh, took advantage of that and wrote to the presidency with no detailed work plan. So what we're beginning to sense is that 
we are is now just about to form a very brand new idea, it, it, I mean, an, an agenda that he believes he's going to use to be able to, to live up to the expectation of the people. But what is very critical and is important for us to highlight that here is the fact that though we are not predating a, a totally gloom and doom situation, but the history of, uh, of, of coalition governments across the African continent is such that it has been one of utter failures. So given the, the current breed of individuals that are on board at the moment, it makes us to, to question or it backs the question of what is the sincerity of George Weah when it comes to the issue of change? Because the truth of the matter is that there are about six to almost seven different uh, uh, offic officials of the Mrs. Ellie Johnson Salif Lair uh, administration who were appointed last night into this administration of George Manawia. So it, it backs the question of the seriousness of change. What is it that those individuals who had the opportunity to work for Mrs. Ellie Johnson Salif that they did not change, that they are going to now change in the new administration led by George Manawia? That's one aspect that of, 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 the, of, the, of the point. The other point here is that that uh, Ibrahim regularly so indicated. There is a particular element in that coalition that was basically associated with mayhem and corruption, and a number of those individuals who are in George Weah immediate kitchen cabinet have got some tinted records. So uh, our skepticism is drawn from the fact that those individuals have not had any positive record of service to the state and the people. So the fact that they are now associated with George Weah and he's likely to appoint all of them into his administration, we believe very seriously that his administration is going to experience massive utter failures in a number of ways. I do agree very seriously that there are some progressive young men who have been who will be appointed by George Weah, who started his, his movement from as far as 2005. Okay, but Amos, those listen, individuals Amos, that we say in want Liberia, to, I want one to, tree. Listen, I really want to move away from the politics, the coalitions, the uh, 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 assembly of politicians and advisors that can get together and move on to some actual practical solutions. Alex, okay, I promised you a fact. Out of 188 countries in the Human Development Index, Liberia is number 177. The country imports more than 80% yeah. of its food. So these are direct challenges that President George Weah has to address. He says he's going to improve the lives of every single Liberian. But at the same time, he says he's going to open the country to private investment and wants to protect business profits. Sometimes in Liberia's history, those two things, developing the country and helping the people, hasn't gone hand in hand with improving private investment. Companies have come in from abroad, taken everything out of the country and not put anything back. How does he address these critical issues for Liberia? Well, there are th three things that he needs to do, that he needs to focus on. Uh, the first one is to focus on building quality infrastructure. So roads, bridges, physical infrastructure is really important. The infrastructure in Liberia, even after uh, uh, over a decade of peace, uh, is still very fragile and it's still very difficult to move around. Uh, investors do want to invest in countries where infrastructure is stronger, more consistent electricity, better running water. The second is the intellectual infrastructure. Education in Liberia is appalling. You, we have seen the figures of showing how majority of graduates fail, for example, even when they're going through the university. There is a crisis in terms of exams and teaching. So building up the skill base in Liberia and its young population to be more employable, to be in the global economy is really important. And the third thing, I think, is corruption. Corruption is endemic, it's pervasive in Liberia, and building up institutions, checks and balances, is going to be really important, because Liberia is competing in a global economy. And so to attract investors, uh, and certainly more ethical investors, who are not going to be predatory in the way that you've spoken about, uh, that's going to be really important. Uh, these are possible, these are achievable. Uh, but uh, time will be short. Uh, Mr. Ware, I think, is, uh, as president, has about a year as a honeymoon uh, before uh, people will start to lose faith and the hope that you've talked about. OK, time is also very short for us. So, Ibrahim, be brief, if you can, please. 
Political appointees receive excessively high wages. There are travel budgets which are ridiculous for government departments. And yet teachers, police officers, other people who perform critical jobs in Liberia barely receive a living wage. Here's another massive challenge. Big question, please, short answer. Well, George Weir, we have to institute frugal or austere fiscal policies to ensure that government has some saving to invest in infrastructural development and socioeconomic advancement. Uh, about 80% of the national budget is spent on wages. And the bulk of those wages go to public officials, political appointees, and not the civil servants, not the teachers, not the medical doctors, not the police officers, the frontline civil servants. So George Ria will have to find some way to introduce equality or equity in wages in Liberia, particularly in the public sector. And again, we have to emphasize that George Ria, President George Ria has to be very vigilant against corruption. He has to avoid the mistakes of the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. the, the, the last 12 years, we saw an attempt to domesticate state authority by President Salif and her family. So in order to avoid this, George Ria, we have to, President Ria, we have to ensure that his government officials are credible, individuals with integrity, and people with whom he has connection that he cannot easily compromise. So he has to make sure that his family members and close friends are not put in positions of trust to the point that he, he himself is not able to institute vigilant measures against them and to prosecute them. President okay. Sally failed miserably okay. in prosecuting corrupt officials. We expect George Ria to live up to the expectation of those that supported him. Those that supported him, supported him okay. on a campaign to fight corruption. Okay. And so he's expected to be vigilant against corruption. Okay. Ibrahim al Bakri, Ney, Amos Twe, and Dr. Alex Vines, thank you very much indeed for your time, all of you. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me.